so I know we're on a tight schedule here, so I'm just going to start doing a little bit of talking while I'm setting up. So uh, what I'd like to go through today is a little bit of uh, a little bit of PowerPoint, very very small amount, just to set the stage as far as what we can do today with uh, with my desktop. That's not in the right place. All right. <coughs> Try Cisco for the password that usually works. So <laughs> <laughs> How did you know? How did you guess that? Okay. So to give you a little brief overview, by the way, where should I stand for the camera? Anywhere particularly? Good. All right. Uh, a little overview of what we can do in ACI, what the policy model looks like, which did Joe talk about that today yet? Or okay, great. So uh, a little bit more of a of a deep dive in terms of how we're storing that information, how it's uh, being accessed, and that ties in very very closely to how you interface with the system, how you configure it, and most importantly how you automate it. Because like Joe said, automation is baked in from the ground up. We didn't go and build a fabric where the CLI is your single point of configuration and then everything else is built on top of that. Rather, the API is the single point of configuration and every, everything else wraps into that, which is the right way to do things. And we're, I, I'm very happy with that change. Uh, so we'll cover the, the object model, do a little bit on the API and SDK. Uh, maybe the, the use cases, I'll skip through those and instead go straight to the demos because I wanted to keep this fairly interactive and you know, death by PowerPoint is no fun for anybody. So solutions overview, I'm sure Joe talked through this a bunch of times, but yeah, essentially our entire fabric is a big switch. Uh, it's a single uh, monolithic device that is configured by the controller. And so that means that you have a single point of management, you have a single point of, of uh, access in terms of fetching data from the system. If you want to go and access anything, any of those counters, uh, atomic counters, BGP session information, ISIS adjacencies, any of that, you can fetch it from the APIC, from the controller, and that does the proxying, it does the necessary actions to get that information back up from the data plane. Uh, as far as what we support in programmability, we have a pretty wide range of functions that we've introduced to uh, enable the ecosystem. And I mean, I know that a lot of people always say like open, yeah, we're open this, open that. But I think that with ACI, we truly have adopted that approach by making a lot of this entirely available. So if somebody doesn't like our GUI, if they don't like the CLI, they're free, entirely free to go and rewrite it from scratch. I don't know anybody's going to do that, but who knows, maybe somebody's very brave. So we did that by exposing the northbound API through both JSON and XML. We've also exposed the ability to program additional layer four through seven services or just value add services using device packages, which I'm sure Joe covered earlier. Uh, the OpFlex protocol is something else that's uh, going to be coming out uh, shortly, or is it already ratified in, in the, no? Check it out. Okay. <laughs> So uh, in either case, that's another mechanism to be able to extend the policy of the fabric outside of it. So like today, our AVS actually uses OpFlex to be able to say, okay, you've defined this EPG over here. Now I want to be able to know about that, be aware of it, and the policy required for it at the hypervisor layer. And OpFlex does that. So it's not like we're saying only AVS can do that. It's an open standard. Anybody can go and write their own OpFlex agent, all the necessary components to it, and then extend the ACI policy into their devices. So we're really trying to, to you know, practice what we preach and say, yes, open is, is good. We support it. Please uh, join us. The, uh, the programmability aspect here is essentially taking what you define in a desired state model, saying, I want to have this configuration of OSPF. I want to have these endpoint groups and these application profiles. And then convert that from a very abstracted out logical model into a concrete model that each individual switch understands. So what we're really doing here is saying, instead of having some uh, larger controller that needs to understand the nuances and the specifics of every single piece of hardware that's being managed by it, we say, no, we're going to tell you this general concept of what we want done, or in some cases, a very specific concept. And then the hardware itself translates that into what it understands of the world. As an example, if I have 
different types of TCAM on a particular switch. I can say I want to create this filter with these rules, with this forwarding policy associated with it. I don't care about whether you have 64,000 TCAM entries, whether it's 128 bits, whether it's you know some other figure. I just want to give you that information and you on the switch level figure it out. And this makes for a very desirable way of interacting with devices because how many times have any of you in the room here written, let's say, your QoS policy for 6500 and then tried to just copy and paste it on like a 7K or something? <laughs> it doesn't work, right? And in this case, we are enabling that level of abstraction, which is a very nice thing when we start going into areas like automation. Try to speed up a little bit here. Uh, the object model is uh, really the brainchild of a couple of very smart engineers that pretty much sat in a room for like a year and figured out how do we take everything in the data center everything, all of the different protocols, the different connectivity models, how you represent an interface, right? An interface, what can it be? It can be Ethernet, it could be a VLAN, uh, or rather a, uh, an SBI, it can be a, uh, a layer three port channel, it can be a lot of different things in interface. So a bunch of people sat and figured out, well, how do we model all of this and figure out how we can make it very, uh, very usable to be able to represent lots of different information using this singular abstracted data format. So the richness that you need to describe not only the network, but also applications, compute, storage, that's all allowed to be reflected within the, uh, the model. Whereas, you know, you look at a, a data center today and you're using, what, VLANs and maybe like, I don't know, object groups if you're, if you're lucky to represent applications. And that's, there's, there's information loss there that you would rather not lose because, again, for cases like troubleshooting, you'd like to be able to know, well, what application is actually being broken here? What's, what's going on? And uh, back to the point earlier about, like, how does troubleshooting look with this? Well. How often in your production data centers do you look at a switch and say, okay, this thing is totally broken. I, I need to reload it because of whatever reason. I need to upgrade the code or something like that. But what applications are going to be impacted by it? I don't know. There's this, this one interface over here that says Dan's server for BitTorrenting or something like that. And of course, in a production data center, and you know you don't want to impact Dan's BitTorrenting because he might be downloading the latest I don't know Avengers movie or something like that. So, uh, but that could have other very important production traffic on there, but maybe it's not described properly. So, being able to take the description of the applications and then do an impact analysis on it, derive what is sitting on a a switch, and know how that's going to impact your applications is a very, very useful tool from a troubleshooting perspective, from a planning perspective, uh, a variety of different uh, uh, means. So this is like the smallest possible way to describe what the, the object model uh, is. Really, we've, we've broken it up into a bunch of different areas. There's different packages to describe different functionality. So like layer four through seven functionality. Um, routing protocols each have their own. So there's a BGP package and an OSPF package. But in either case, you all, all of them sort of fall into this, this general uh, top root that contains all these individual objects. And that includes descriptions of applications, network, uh, security policy, management, hardware. All of that is represented in this model. And they all have relationships to one another. So I can say that this particular object is a child of another one, and that sort of implies containment. And what you might be thinking of here as I describe this is like a file system, right? You, you sort of group your folders logically to say, I'm working on this uh, you know, WAN refresh project. I'm going to start putting all the files underneath here. And it makes it easy to find things. And that's essentially why this is described as a tree. It makes it easy to find things. But you also have the ability to reference between objects. So have forward references and backward references, that kind of stuff. So it makes it very easy to take a look at a sp specific branch of your configuration across the entire fabric and figure out what exactly is going on there. And uh, I'm even working on a tool right now that's going to graphically depict that. So you say, 
drill down into this particular tenant and show me what does his configuration look like? What does the tree look like? What EPGs does he have? How do those EPGs relate to one another? That kind of information. Uh, so the the MIT is this uh, really uh, it's it's the the uh, the instantiation of that model, and so that means that all of the configuration that is uh, defined within your controller is stored in this MIT. And again, it's a tree-based structure, and it's really just representing the classes as actual instantiated objects. By the way, how many people in the room here like? know anything about programming or like okay a couple okay that's good because typical when I talk to a net network audience people look at me like I'm done with you you know they don't want to hear it so uh, I'll keep it short on the the programming theory but really you know we go through and and follow a lot of concepts from object-oriented programming to be able to introduce inheritance uh, you know have have a tree-based structure so you can very easily traverse through it and find information so the REST API, uh, we've got all of this information in our MIT, but now we need a method to access it. So, I mean, what, what do people use for accessing information nowadays? It's pretty much all of it is HTTP. It's, you know, SOAP, uh, I forget what was before or after SOAP, but now we're at, we're at REST, and that's sort of like the, the way the industry has gone. Uh, it's a very good mechanism for describing uh, not describing, but, but rather getting information in a programmatic fashion because it allows for things like statelessness. It allows for things like uh, queries and self-documenting uh, functionality. So that's what we've decided to implement the uh, the access into our our controller with. So anything that's in the object model in the MIT, you can manipulate that state. You can query it. You can fetch information from there. Uh, really any actions that you want to take. So if I say I want to go and upgrade my fabric, I can go in there and create an upgrade policy and then execute it and then fetch the results of it and see what happened. So you can really take the entire process of upgrading an entire data center and automate it in a very simple fashion. And like the GUI al already does that. But like, if you happen to not want to ever have to click more than like three times to do something, you can write yourself a script to do that automated fabric upgrade process. So it's really, really cool from that perspective. Uh, something else that I'll show you how it, how it uh, really uh, yields a lot of dividends is that concept that the CLI, the GUI, the SDK, all are using that same REST API. So I have uh, a question. Yes. This is, this is good. Yeah. Love it. Um, when I see new applications like APIC, and we saw the same thing with UCSM because it's based off of a similar managed object structure, what's preventing this same method being used for the switch operating system itself? What's preventing it? There's nothing preventing it right now, actually. Well, it's not. it doesn't exist that way right now. No, the switches themselves actually are accessed through this MIT. So In if you this use case specifically because that OS has been rewritten, but we're yes. looking at APIs like 1PK and, and NX API, which are fundamentally built on the CLI rather than the other way around, which is what this is. Yes. Yeah. What's preventing that? Uh, I <laughs> time. So I'm uh, time might the be time, it. or is there is there another factor I'm not, I'm, I'm I'm missing because we I'm keep probably not at liberty. Or I'm, I'm not the right guy to, to ask about it because I don't work for like not sure. CG. But I don't know, Joe. You have a better answer. <laughs> Some interesting things over time. Well, we're waiting for that, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I feel your pain. I've, I've been doing a lot of stuff on, on GitHub with like the, the Nexus 9000 standalone, yep. which again is based on that same model, uh, and just trying to support it on different platforms as well, like 5K, 7K. And you're right, there are a lot of challenges with it. This totally eliminates that. I mean, yep. like when there's a, a change in code on, on APIC, mm -hmm. I can take code that I've written and just you know, maybe maybe change the, the the IP address or something like that. Well, it allows us to use the same tools, right? Like, if re regardless of what our deployment is, we might have a couple switches, or we might have a whole fabric with APIC and all that cool stuff. Um, fundamentally, our tools shift if that if that change happens, right? Because we have to use expect scripts in one case and a nice sweet library in the other case. Yeah, like, it's exactly. very messy trying to integrate the two together. It is, yeah. Um, I've I've actually done a little bit of it just for like things like fabric discovery to figure out maybe what, what routers are connected at the periphery of your fabric yeah. and then go and automatically configure them for 
routing protocols. So say, look, I have an, a, a, uh, an ACI fabric, and I want to automatically configure both my fabric and my Nexus 7000 to communicate OSPF to each other. Mm -hmm. And so you're right, sort of bridging the gap between the two fundamentally different APIs yep. is, is a challenge, but it's, it's doable. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's possible. So, so if you had standalone 9Ks in the environment with ACI deployed, could you actually write a device package for those? That, that's something that they're uh, considering doing, not necessarily for the standalone 9K, though it, it might happen, but uh, they're looking at uh, integrating like the uh, ASR 9K and Nexus right. 7000 with uh, Opflex agents so that you can go and control those for your WAN, DCI, that kind of stuff. Even even less so device package, just just to maintain that single pane of glass. Saying there was this reason we needed a standalone pod, just again, standalone boxes to be able to manage them through APIC, but you so you know the, the user would actually have to write some you know some backend code to do that. But it, would it be possible to to leverage yeah, absolutely. You, you could. If you want to write a device package to manage a Nexus 9000, yeah. you're more than welcome to. You probably need my help, but that's, you know, that's well within the realm of, of uh, possibility. A 1PK type thing. What was that? Like a 1PK type thing. NX API back to the APIC or something. Yeah. Have you worked with NX API? A little bit, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. What's your name? Uh, Jason. Jason, okay. Have you contributed to GitHub? No, I have Oh, not. come on. Matt has, though. <laughs> I have. Oh, hey Matt. Yeah. Nice to meet you. I <laughs> saw. Well, I've seen many of your polls. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for approving them. I appreciate it. Did I approve them or no? I think you did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mike has been sitting on that other one for like yep. months now. Yep. I, I was yelling at him the other day for it. Don't yeah. worry. Oh, it, it'll it'll get approved soon. <laughs> Please. So, all of this information that you want to pull out of the uh, the fabric can be received, right? Uh, statistics, faults, events, configuration, all that stuff that Joe talked about, right? That gives you visibility for troubleshooting. You, you're not required to do that through the GUI. As a result, you can now very easily go and fetch that, figure out what is relevant to you. Maybe you want to uh, introduce in your, uh, your overall a cloud automation portal, a display so that application owners can see, all right, I see what, what the health is of my VMs, but now show me what the health is of my application profile. You can do that. You can say, fetch the health score for this particular user's application profile and show them what's going on. Visibility is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if you're open and transparent with your users, they'll probably be happier with you because they'll know what's going on. So that's something else that, that I think is a very cool feature. Finally, uh, event-driven notifications, which is uh, really, I mean, it's just keeping up with the times. Nobody wants to do polling-based mechanisms. So this gives you an interrupt-driven mechanism where you open up a WebSocket with uh, the APIC and then subscribe to events. And as those events uh, uh, come in, you know, a change uh, on a particular object or, you know, a, a host comes up, what have you, you get that notification via the WebSocket. So that's a very handy mechanism to just keep up with what's going on in your fabric. Just, just something on that. Um, yeah. Everyone's got an API these days because that's what all the cool kids do and that, that's, that's great. But the problem is that not everyone's got the time to develop and integrate things using those APIs. So will Cisco be doing, say, some standard integration packages or something like that? Say, like I have, say, I have several single panes of glass because, you know, everyone has a number of single panes of glass. And, you know, it'd be nice if there's some standard integrations with some of those. You know, uh, not, not for all of them, obviously, but, yes. you know. Yes, Mike yes, yes. I'm in advanced services, so you're like asking me like, hey, can, can I pay you to, to do uh, yes, this? Yes, so it's not so much more that <laughs> can I pay you the $3,000 a day for Cisco professional services, but more like, you know, here's a well-known um, other management system. Here's a standard pa yeah. integration package released yeah. and blessed by Cisco. Yeah, uh, so there's uh, there, there are going to be uh, integration points with like UCSD. So that's potentially something that, that might be helpful. Uh, any vendor that's out there is more than welcome to create their, their integration package. Um, I imagine that on the partner front, there's going to be some validation. Right now we're doing that for the, uh, 
uh, for the layer four through seven partners. So we do verify their packages, we do ensure that they're all good, and then uh, make them available. Uh, as far as single panes of glass, I think that that's somewhat more for the the marketing side to to yeah, discuss. I mean, I'm, I'm like I'm not saying specifically for this, but you know, like say. SCOM has wide adoptance, uh, wide acceptance, so, you know, other other applications, Venus, whatever, will sort of release integration packages. Did you say for Splunk? SCOM. Um, uh, Microsoft System Center, uh, was it? Oh, uh, the, the, uh, not, um, not SCVMM, but something else? No, no, no. no oh, okay, I, the, I'm not familiar with it. Oh, but yeah, this is, this, is on the, this is the ops management side of things. So yeah, you know, yeah. Reporting current status of your network and all yeah. your other applications and systems. Well, honestly, if they have a, an API or a, a plug-in framework that can go and externally fetch information, then yeah, it's possible. There's mm -hmm. going to be a PowerShell. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things, where, you, know, you know what I mean? It's, everything's possible. And everyone's like, I've got this API, I've got this API. <laughs> it's like, well, I, I don't have time to to write really interesting so integrations. I'll, and, you know, I, I can do, I do the basic integrations for my customs and things. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes to get real value from it, you need you need the people who really know it to, to yeah. Get deep so I'll give you give you two two answers. One is yes, go to AS. The second is that we are actively contributing to our GitHub community right now. There's stuff going on there uh, for the Nexus 9K standalone. There's a uh, a Splunk adapter there um, under uh, the ACI uh, yeah, group I mean, there. Actually, Splunk's a really good example. You know, I, mean, I, was, I was pleased to see that um, us earlier this week, I think I saw something about, about ACI and Splunk. Yeah. And yeah, that's a good example of where here's a well-known, uh, I don't know, Splunk's a, what's hell, it was just a kind of before your logs and now it's this whole big data application thing hiding yeah. behind it, you know. Splunk does everything. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome yeah. But I mean, and that, that's, that's a good example. I was where, hey, here's something that's widely known and used by a lot of people. And Cisco saying, "Hey, here's here's some standard sort of stuff for that, right, you know, right, right, right. Because rather than everyone out there trying to individually do their own sort of thing, yeah. So we're, I mean, we're trying to help you with that, or at least give you enough to uh, figure it out on your own. Mm -hmm. So that way, at least, and, and that's a big part of it as well as documentation or whatever as well. Because yeah, some vendors yeah. are kind of like, yeah, well, you know, here's like." thousand pages of docs knock yourself out giving you examples right showing you how to yeah. do it yeah. i can see a lot of value in that i mean because really the success of this is how many people you can pull into this ecosystem right because you want to integrate with all of these different things make yourself the value add in this and buy all of that integration so if you give people these even if they're not fully fleshed out tools right but they're just a a bit of here get started right i think people can take that and run i mean i know as engineers we hate reinventing the wheel necessarily but if someone gives us a few lines of code we can take that yeah. and, and do a ton of stuff with it yeah absolutely so just recently actually we posted uh, a tool under the the aci category that's it's called uh nexus dash and it's just a simple simple uh web front end based on django that uses celery in the back end for fetching information and it goes and it gets a lot of this this uh information about your network and then displays it on a nice web GUI. It's not going to replace what you have today in your monitor monitoring solutions, but it's made in a modular fashion. You can add stuff, so that's that's very beneficial. I need to speed up a little bit here. So, um, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip past these unless you guys really really care about them. But this is just like sort of low level REST interface stuff. No, okay, good. All good. So we've got the the REST API. Uh, we have a mechanism of looking through that information. If you're familiar with UCS, you're probably familiar with Visore. That's really just the browser. That's how you can go through and figure out what's in my, my uh, object store, what's present there, and then use that to actually give you information as far as what you can fetch from it, which is a really, really useful tool because if you don't have Windows Explorer or Finder, then, I mean, you're never gonna find what's on your file system, and the same thing applies here. You can think of it as, you know, one of those file browsers. Uh, we've also got this API inspector, which is a phenomenally useful tool. Its, it's simplicity is, you know, beaten by none. I mean, it doesn't really do anything other than display uh, what's going on as you click through the GUI. However, having that information allows you to figure out, when I click this button, what's actually happening. And so if you want to go and codify that, automate that process, it makes it very, very simple to use the GUI as your sort of how-to guide, and then use the uh, API to go and repeat that in a very uh, programmatic fashion. 
So, you know, we can go through a process like creating a tenant, right? So we'll uh, create a, a network on that tenant. We'll add, uh, well, okay, this already went through. Uh, once we s hit the submit button, we see this is the JSON request that was posted to get this content into the, the APIC. And I hate JSON. If, no, I don't hate Jason. If there's anybody in the room named Jason, I hate JSON. It's okay. It's right. Jason. <laughs> <laughs> JSON. Okay. Uh, it's, it's way too, you know, not easy to follow. But we support both XML and JSON, so whichever one you want to go with, you're fine. But the information required to, uh, to, to push uh, the configuration that you want to add on the controller is there. It's all very readily accessible. So we've got the mechanism to, to interface with the controller, but you probably don't want to have to go and implement that REST API by hand. So we've got this SDK. The current SDK is written in Python. Uh, we're going to be open sourcing it uh, very soon, I hope. Uh, and there's also going to be an additional component that should also be open sourced with it, which is a code generator called Zen. So if you don't happen to like Python, if you like Ruby, you can use Zen to generate a Ruby binding. And I actually wrote the, the Ruby binding for the, the SDK as well, so, so we could have a, a Puppet plugin for it. But uh, you can generate any language uh, the, in any language your SDK implementation and then if you're standardized on like PowerShell use PowerShell if you're standardized on Java use Java so on and so forth uh, now we talked about the fact that you've got all this information available through Visore through the API inspector now you want to be able to take that and codify it well if you go onto GitHub, there's this tool up there called Aria, which any Game of Thrones fans here? I was gonna ask. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. She's my favorite character. She's just the, the laugh in the last episode. <laughs> once she, that was oh man, that was great. All right, so the GUI creates REST, right? That's that's pretty much the native uh, level there, right? Uh, API Inspector shows us Aria takes the REST calls and converts those to code. So I can quickly codify what is JSON, which is really, really small over there. Uh, sorry about that. And then uh, turn it into Python code, which is a tremendous time saver. I find that everybody <laughs> within my team, everybody within Cisco practically, is using this because it writes the code for you. And you just have to change some token values there, which is a really, really nice feature. Uh, so I'm going to go into some use cases here, because Joe's telling me I got uh, less time than I'd like to have. Uh, let's see. Any questions while I'm trying to move around here? When are we going to get a Nexus 9000 simulator? Mm. Mm. Good question. Uh, Nexus 9000 simulator? You yeah. mean standalone? Enabled, yeah, whatever. To be able to do API stuff without actually purchasing a mm -hmm. Switch. Oh, so the, uh, the, the, the APIC simulator, uh, that is supposed to be coming around, but I'm not sure when. How about Nexus 9000? Like just NX API? I don't, I'm not sure if it's going to happen. <laughs> this is this is just How a, switch with you? a sampling I mean, point. So this will be okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let me uh, sort of power. Well, this I mean, it, while you're pulling that, I mean, this is what we're talking about with GitHub, right? We talk about GitHub and have posting code to GitHub. But that's a great first step. But ultimately, it's more about it's, that's one piece of it. It's about community. It's about building a community of people that 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 work, do the work for you, right? And part of that is giving them the tools needed to do that. Right. You're you're absolutely right. The, you know, ninety percent of the people are waiting like anxiously to be able to contribute to stuff like this, but they can't. They don't have access. Yes, they just don't. exactly. Yeah. So um, their DevNet has recently gone through a huge refresh, mm -hmm. and uh, it's continuing to go under a lot of refreshes. And uh, one of the discussions that had uh, taken place was making all of these simulators available on DevNet. So you sign up for like you know similar to an Apple Developer Program membership, right? For yep. whatever sum, you're able to get access to the simulators, you know, maybe some lab time, whatever. Um, I, I can follow up on it, and yeah. then you know, I'll respond to you on GitHub or something like that's that. That's fine. I mean, you know. that, that's, that's what most of your competitors have already done, so it's... Yeah, yeah I, I agree. We need, to, we need to get on top of that. 